Hello. Me and my fellow group members have been tasked with informing you all, the viewer, about the Renaissance. The Renaissance was a period in the late 15th century where many things were changed, such as art and literature, but most importantly, religion. And this is what we will be talking about. Now, in order to talk mainly about religion, we need to talk about the Protestant Reformation and Martin Luther. Now, the Protestant Reformation ended in the 16th century, but it took place in Western Europe, and you would think that they all began at the same time, but no. They actually began, begun in Italy in 1420. Now, followed by Germany in 1450, Spain in 1492, France in 1494, and England in the late 15th century. Now, Martin Luther was initially studying to be a lawyer in his time. Now, like most students, he really hated the profession. One day, he was walking home in during a storm, and he was struck by lightning. What are the odds? Now, in his time of grief and pain, he yelled out in a panic, Help me, Saint Anne! I'll become a monk! So, apparently, he survived, and in the next two weeks, he withdrew from his university, and he became a monk and sent out a letter to his family informing him of his decision, who I w am sure were just pleasantly delighted to know that they spent all that money on school because, well, you know, it's very, very cheap. Now, during Martin's time as a monk, he was sent to Rome. He ignored all the brilliant arts in the streets and focused mainly on the corruption of the government. He saw priests in the streets rushing through mass as if it meant nothing and completely and very vividly just going against the laws of the Bible. Martin Luther was very conscious about his sins and would constantly be going to the church in order to confess. Eventually, his confessor got very, very fed up with him and sent him off to Wittenberg University where they felt that he would be out of their hair, really, but also be able to teach scripture. It was during his time in Wittenberg where he discovered his verse which sparked the entire Reformation. The quote was, Salvation comes through faith, not good works. Not through prayer, fasting, vigils, pilgrimages, relics, giving to the poor, the sacraments, or any action that a person can take. We can never be good enough through actions alone. We can only have faith. Now his idea came into full-scale conflict with the church when a friar came to his town asking for indulgences. Indulgences was a series of payments paid by the people to the church in exchange for forgiveness and salvation. But Martin Luther's quote said that only faith can bring salvation. No action, not even money. Martin Luther was very, very upset at this. And so one night, he decided to make a statement. He nailed the 95 theses upon the church door. The 95 theses were 95 reasons and arguments against the church on what they were doing wrong. Now, he nailed that upon the door of the church one morning. Clutching his cross, he hoped and prayed that the people would take his side and that he would make a statement against the church. Luther kept taking his accusations step by step farther by saying that the churches had no religious power, that their rituals had no power, that priesthood was a human invention and that people did not need them in order to receive the grace of God. Now the church being such a powerful force to be reckoned with decided to, of course, go whine to the empire that Martin was in. They decided to bring Martin to court. So he entered the court with a very wide variety of people following him. Yet, even with followers, everyone still expected him to recant and deny his actions, apologize to the church, and live on his life peacefully. But that's not what happened. He actually decided to stick by his faith instead of going against his God and his ideas. He protested against the church, still in court, in front of the emperor and the priest. Then he was called heretic, and he was then exiled out of the kingdom. Now, understanding that he would be under risk of persecution by just following himself out into some other random place, he decided to stage his own kidnapping and disappear off the map. He then left to another kingdom that was not very friendly to the empire that he was originally in and he went to hiding. During his time there, he used his time very wisely. He created an entire copy of the Bible and 
he translated it all from Latin into French and English and Germanic. And this was very, very crucial to Reformation, since now the entire common folk would be able to read and be able to come up with their own ideas of what the Bible says. Before then, the church and the priests would read it aloud to the other people in their own translation. They could lie and they could say whatever they wanted. They could make you believe anything that would be originally a sin. Now, the people armed with knowledge would be able to create their own ideas and thoughts and beliefs. They were now independent from the church. Many religions were then formed, and thus the true reformation began. Salutations. This is Pal Dos of the Renaissance Project. That's French. We'll get to that. But for now, my segment is covering... Wait, they're actually called... Alright, let's get into this. So basically, all of it started with this dude, Martin Luther. He's a friar. We already covered that. But he had some pretty radical ideas, and he used a printing press to get them all around. So to start off part two of our video on the Holy Wars, I'm going to be talking about the German Peasants' Revolt of 1524. This is where the peasants were revolting against the very Catholic Holy Roman Empire. P.S. The peasants are pretty Protestant. So they revolt against them. They kind of get really murdered. And so most of them die. A lot of them die. The ones that didn't die are now really poor because they're being taxed really heavily. But even though this wasn't a win for them, this still sparked other conflicts in Europe. And so after the Peasants' Revolt in Germany, we, that brings us to the Eighty Years' War. This was a war in the Netherlands where the Protestants, they were called Calvinists then, they believed that only God had the power over humanity and the church, in which their rulers, Catholic Spain, they didn't really agree with. So they started fighting. This actually brought Protestant England into the fight, which then started focusing Spain's wrath onto England and not just the Netherlands. This kind of spread out Spain, so their supplies were running really low, and they were spread very thin, which made them a lot easier to fight. This war still took 80 years and was very bloody, but ultimately was a Protestant victory. After the 80 years war was the French Wars of Religion. In this war we saw the French Catholics fighting the French Protestants. These French Protestants called themselves Huguenots, but they're still basically Protestants. What made them especially deadly is because lots of them were nobles, so they could actually challenge the Catholic Church. Tensions came to a boiling point at the Massacre of Vassay in 1562. This is where many unarmed Protestants were murdered by Catholic nobles. This basically started off the wars. After the Massacre of Vassay, the French Protestants were helped out by the English Protestants. The Massacre of Vassay kicked off the French Wars for Religion. After the Massacre of Vassay, the French Protestants were backed up by the Protestant English, but the Church was also backed up by Catholic Spain and the Pope. This started off the war. After thousands of Protestant deaths, the war was finally ended with the passing of the Edict of Nantes in 1598. Sadly, this happy ending didn't last. In 1685, the Huguenots in France were stripped of their civil rights, and the Reformation ended. Now for the Thirty Years' War. To start off the Thirty Years' War, some Protestant states join in and just elect their new king, Frederick V, without talking to any Protestant unions. Now, this made the Holy Roman Empire kind of angry, so they just decided to curb this rebellion and kill him. This makes the Protestant Union really angry and finally gets people like Saxony to join in on their little union. So the Emperor's attempt in just trying to curb a little rebellion starts a full-on war. And so throughout the war, France finally joins the coalition on the side of the Protestants. After many regions have been completely wiped out, the war is finally ended with the Treaty of Osnabrück and Munster, ending a war that has changed Europe forever.
Hello, and welcome back to part three of our Renaissance video project. Today, I'm going to be talking about how the Protestant Reformation affected today's life. So, Wyatt talked about Martin Luther, and Ian talked about their religious wars. And now I'm going to be talking about how it affected today's real world. So, of course, we can talk about different things like politics, government relations, the progression of the church, and rights and freedoms that have been given back to the people. Now, to talk about politics, today we have the government, of course. But back then, they had the church, and at that point, really, the church was more powerful than the government. The church had way more land, followers, and money compared to the government. The church's money mostly came from indulgences. Indulgences were when people would pay money to confess their sins and basically be free from it. Now, that probably, of course, led to more followers, and when more followers came, just more growth. So with more followers coming, that meant more people going to help them fight, and, of course, more indulgences which led to just immense more growth. So basically at that point, the church was just a domino's effect of just fuel going straight into the church to help it grow immensely more than the government at the time. Now jumping back from the church then to the church today, the church back then had way more power compared to the church today. Of course, today's church has gone down in power and of course given way more rights and freedom to today's people. Now the churches today are just a fraction of what they used to be during the Protestant Reformation. For instance, like the Catholic Church today couldn't host an entire army, lead millions, and just gain in money, followers, land, and all of that in today's society. Churches they couldn't even imagine owning as much land as the Protestant churches did in that time, because, well, they own more than half of Europe. Churches they still have a ton of followers, don't get me wrong. But the number of European Christians right now is over 500 million, and that dwarfs the population of the European Christians back then. Now today's U.S. wouldn't even be the same if it wasn't for the Protestant Reformation. Because, well, the Protestant Reformation was basically the lead to, of course, today's United States. Without the Protestant Reformation, the United States really wouldn't be what it is today. Because, well, it kind of striked people wanting their own freedom of religion and speech, and that led to, of course, everyone coming over to the United States present day and making it what it is today. So now, without Martin Luther and all those religious wars happening, today's churches wouldn't be really what they are today. In conclusion, my group and I think that without the Protestant Reformation, the U.S., the churches, our rights, our freedoms, religion, speech, everything wouldn't be the same without it. Thank you for watching our video over the Protestant Reformation in the Renaissance.